Well, we've had an opportunity in the past couple of weeks uh, to be able to have an opportunity to not only begin to experience who we are in Christ, but we realize that the very experience that we saw with our Lord Jesus from the moment that his life and especially his ministry began with the battle for his life, for his purpose, is the same battle that begins with us. We, we titled this theme, if you will, of this series as having to do with winning the war, not so much without, but winning the war within. Every single one of us, no matter who we are or how long we've been in this walk with Jesus, has a battle to win. And that battle is within. In some cases, we think that the moment that we come to Christ, that Jesus is going to just settle and solve everything that was our issue or a challenge upon coming to faith in Christ. But what we discover is, oftentimes the heat gets turned up once we come to Christ. And it's almost as if God rewards one victory over a trial or a test with a whole nother one. And that's important to keep in mind. It's actually important for it to just be out in the open for us to consider as Christians. I mean, when we look at Jesus' life himself, subsequent to his baptism, what was, what was the case with him? He was thrust into the wilderness only to be tested by the devil. There was a war. There was a battle for his life and for God's purpose upon that ministry of his. And as disciples of Jesus, as ones who identify with Christ, we have to recognize that that's the same battle for us. We found ourselves using 2 Corinthians in chapter 10 as a launching point to be able to appreciate what exactly we're talking about when we talk about winning the battle within. 2 Corinthians in chapter 10. Our go-to text was verses 3 through 6, where the Apostle Paul, writing to this church, wrote, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. And so here Paul beautifully, eloquently lays out before us what this whole spiritual warfare looks like. Now, granted, in Paul's case, he had physical flesh and blood opponents and enemies who were setting out to rob his purpose disturb his identity in Jesus, slander his character and his reputation in the eyes of other people. In your case and in mine, perhaps we may not have flesh and blood opponents that are out to get us. But in any case, you know what's interesting is sometimes we don't even need to wait for there to be one. We just have an odd, strange way of creating them ourselves here and here. I've told the story before, but I think it's been a while and it probably deserves repeating the story of a man who was on a boat but eventually landed at an island where he was stranded all by himself for a long time, only after quite some time for there to be another ship where they noticed, getting close to this island, that there must be some presence that this island was habitable. And as they get closer to the island, they see smoke coming up. They're like, okay, there is somebody there. And so they dock and they end up encountering each other. And the person has nothing but one question after another for this person who's been on this island for quite a while. And he says, um, I mean, you, you, you've got to help me here. Why, why, the, why the, three, the three huts behind you? Oh, that one, that's, that's my home. Okay, but that still doesn't explain the other two. He says, oh, that's my church. Okay, but how about the third? That's the church I used to go to. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that even when you're the lone congregant in a congregation of one. You can still, you can still choose to have a fight with yourself and walk out. And that, that story beautifully illustrates how sometimes we don't even need to wait to have opponents. We have an odd way of going places in our own heads that end up making opponents, that contend. Contend with what, you may say? with our purpose, with our identity in Christ, with everything that Jesus secured through his death for us, with everything that God says is yours now that you belong to Jesus, but we're not walking in it. It's kind of like what our worship leader just beautifully pointed out is, is that's your freedom. Show it off. 
And it's amazing how we can just say, you know what? I'm bored. It's been a while since I've, an opponent. I've had an opponent. I'll just create one of my own. And Paul here is talking about strongholds. And we've seen strongholds before. They could, they could be built with all sorts of material, all sorts of rock or stone or whatever the case may be that's durable. But we don't need to wait to have physical strongholds to be able to make sense out of them. The kind of stronghold that the Apostle Paul is talking about here in 2 Corinthians are thought patterns. Okay? They're thought patterns. There's ways of thinking that we adopt at one point in time, but don't do anything about. And then they just hang out, they bring their baggage, they drop it, they unzip it, they start taking the clothes out and saying, I'm about to move in. And they, they start stocking up the closet, they make the linen, they're like, Brum Man from Fifth Flow, from Martin. <laughs> How did you get in here? We let them in. <laughs> We let those negative thoughts in, and we let them begin to have a way with us in our identity. That's a stronghold. That's a stronghold. It doesn't happen overnight. It's something that moves in that we had every opportunity to do something about at that point, but didn't. Oh, we kept coming to church. Oh, yeah, we, 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 we kept the word. We, we, we kept being in community. We kept doing all the... Christian things, if you will, but while at the same time adopting, harboring, and being hospitable toward thoughts that were foreign to who God is, to who we now are in Jesus, to what his purpose is for our life, and to what he wants us to know about everything else. And we're wondering, why does my Christian life look the way that it does? And then we even set out to try to come against these strongholds through just any means whatsoever. I mean, we'll, we'll find anything on YouTube. We'll go to Barnes & Noble. We'll pick up a friend. I mean, we'll, we'll do anything we can. And what does Paul say? For though we walk in the flesh, the weapons of our warfare are not according to the flesh. The way that we bring down strongholds, thought patterns that are contrary to the knowledge of God is not according to the flesh. It's not according to the means, if you will, of this world. In other words, I don't need to get more proud. I don't need to be more into myself. I don't need to be more narcissistic. I don't, I don't need to double down in all of the other things that I've been doing. No, 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 no. So where do I need to go? I need to go further. I need to go deeper in who I am in Christ. So what does Paul say? If they're not according to the flesh, then what are they according to? Two is the question you and I should be asking. And he lays it right there in the text. He says, verse 4, for the, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but of divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. You remember last week we talked about not only destroying strongholds, but we talked about how we destroy strongholds. Who am I? Is the question of all questions. It's an identity question. Who are you? Who are we? The moment that we come to faith in Christ, we need to be able to have an answer to that question. Who am I now that I belong to Jesus? And what do we see? We went to 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 21, which is really the heart of the gospel. For our sake... For our sake, he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, to become sin for us, so that we, through him, might become the righteousness of God. The gospel. So one of the ways in which we destroy strongholds is by knowing who we are in Christ. You see, what allows strongholds to remain in my life, even as a Christian, notice, who's Paul writing to? He's not talking to the world and telling them about their strongholds. He's talking to the church. church. These are churchgoers. These are people who have no problem coming to church, no problem calling themselves Christians. And yet, what is the topic? Strongholds. It's amazing how we can check all of the right boxes off, so to speak, in terms of a legit Christian 
and what a legit Christian would believe. And yet, when it comes down to how we live, how we function in this world, it's opposed to what we checked off. And Paul says, no, 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 no. You've got to destroy them. But how do you destroy them? By knowing your identity in Christ. And the first place we went to begin to really establish our identity in Christ is you are the righteousness of God. You see, Paul says there in 2 Corinthians 5, for our sake, he made Jesus to become sin for us who knew no sin. And what, we, what do we see there? We see the great exchange, a glorious exchange, where our sins, as it were, were imputed, our sins were ascribed, our sins were transferred to Jesus, and Jesus' righteousness was in turn imputed, ascribed, or attributed to us. Everything that he undeservingly received on the cross out of love for me, as a result of, I now get to undeservingly benefit from. Everything that was ours became his on that tree. And everything that was rightfully his became undeservingly mine as a result of him on that tree. That's the great exchange. You see, the way in which you and I have acceptance with God, righteousness in God, is because Jesus was prepared to become sin for us. Now, he didn't sin in the sense that he was a sinner. The Bible tells us he committed no sin. The Bible tells us that he was tempted in every way like we are, yet without sin. John tells us that in him there was no sin. In John 8, he looks at the religious leaders and he says, which of you, which of you convicts me of sin? No one. He was sinless. And that's important because what did we point out? What led to our justification was what he accomplished. Justified. Justified never sin. You see, when Jesus died, he accomplished two things. And we emphasize those two realities. Number one, his death is what gets me out of hell. But his life is what gets me into heaven. Okay? It's important. It's important. It's not just as if I had never sinned. It's also just as if I had always obeyed. When you and I trust in Jesus in terms of his finished work and what he did for us, not only are our sins transferred to Jesus, past, present, and future, his righteousness now is credited to us. You see, it's not enough for God to wipe the slate clean. That's not enough. That just gets you to zero. That just gets you and me out of hell, as I said. What gets us into heaven is Jesus' sinless and his perfect life. This is important. This is important. It wasn't enough for him to die. It was also important for his life to be what it was. Okay? That's what God wants us to see. Theologians refer to this as the passive and active obedience. Passive obedience is Jesus becoming a curse for us. Jesus suffering in our place for our sins. That's his passive obedience. Jesus' active obedience is Jesus doing everything that pleases the Father. I do always those things which please my Father. It's that life, that perfect life, which is yours and mine now. That's why when God sees us, if you're in Christ today, when God sees us, he sees us every way in which he looks at his son. But that's not the way my week looked. But that's not how my weekend was. But that's not how you... You see, the problem is we look too much within rather than looking without. Okay? Rather than looking without. What allows you and me to move forward in our Christian life is not so much looking within, but looking without at who Christ is and who we now are because we're in him. Right? Right? Okay? Notice... He calls it an argument. Where do you see arguments, typically? Debate, in debate settings. That's exactly what happens. Our mind, our head, is debating with God and his word. So every day, God has a promise for you. He has a truth, something to encourage you, something to remind you of your identity. And then there's those thoughts. They can come from the flesh, sinful nature, who we were in Adam. They can come from the devil, 
They could come from the world. They could come from what we're tuning into. That's why we need to be careful of what we're consuming. I don't care if it's the flesh, the world, or the devil. In any case, these thoughts in the form of arguments are coming up. So here it is. Your defendant, your Lord Jesus, stands up, and he gives his case with the time that the judge gives. And then there's a cross-examination. And these thoughts are coming. These thoughts are coming. And notice what Paul says here. He says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. The way you come at the cross-examination when it wants to challenge, but oh, if you, if you saw him last week, if you knew who she was in her previous life, if you knew what they used to be caught up with before they joined the church, if you knew what's still going on, if you knew that that's still her struggle, right? Those are the arguments, okay? Those are the arguments, not only are the arguments coming in that form, the arguments also come in the form of what everybody and their mom thinks your life should look like. <laughs> and you got this standard now that you need to live by in order to obtain righteousness. If it's not the righteousness that God gives you, it's the righteousness that is in somebody's hands that says, I'm only going to give it to you. I'm only going to accept you. I'm only going to be... Uh, in approval of you insofar as you live according to my expectations. And Paul says, how do we destroy them? We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion. Notice what they're being raised against, the knowledge of God. The only way you can see these arguments for what they truly are is if you and I know the word and what God says about us now that we belong to Jesus. I've counseled a lot of people who've come out of abuse and trauma and who've dealt with a lot of different situations in their past. And it's amazing how one of the keys, there's a number of them, but one of the keys that almost leads to the beginning of breakthrough in their lives, almost invariably, is when they notice that there's an alternative way to look at themselves in the situation. You see, the predator or the, the abuser, or the person who was exploiting their position, whatever that position was, whether it was a parent, an employer, a spiritual leader, you name it, uh, um, an intimate lover, the, the only way they were able to leverage their words that were bringing harm, abuse, to the person was to the degree that there wasn't an alternative word, set of words that challenged that. That's why they always keep them away from other people. They don't like them mingling with other people. Why? Because it's kind of hard to continue to believe lies when you're exposed to truth. Right? And that's exactly what happens in our life, whether that has been our experience or not, is the way in which we begin to see progress is the moment that we realize these aren't the only thoughts I need to be entertaining. This isn't the only way to see myself. This isn't the only part to the story. God's also got his version. God's also got to say, you see, this, if, if we can get this, Jesus said in John 8, 31, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The truth about what? The truth about God. The truth about this world, the truth about what he's up to, the truth about me now that I belong to him, the truth about what he says is my certain future, that truth. When you know that truth, you're free. The chains break and you begin to live out of the life that has always been yours, which is why we said last week, the Christian life is all about huh, becoming what you already are. <laughs> Amen. It's about becoming what you already are. I know it's a paradox, but it's all over the Christian life, right? We, we move forward from victory, not for victory. Jesus was the one who had to obtain it, actually. That's why he, remember I said, that's why we don't need just his death, we need his life, right? Because his death just gets us out of hell. It assures us of what won't be our destiny, but it doesn't get us into heaven. We need his life, his perfect life, his sinless life, his obedient life, his righteous life, which he earned by living here 33 years. God said, after 33 years, accepted, 
perfect. I'm pleased. You and I didn't have to. What did we have to do? We just needed to be in him. And that track record is now ours. That track record is now ours. Hallelujah. And so we begin our Christian life from a place of a newfound identity. And we move forward in our Christian life from that place. So really, in all actuality, our whole life, if you've been tracking with me, our whole life essentially is about catching up to who we already are. <laughs> That's it. That's it. You ever try to catch up with somebody? It's like, man, I don't know if I could catch up. It's just, we, we already are that. And all we're doing now in our whole lifetime is catching up to what God already sees as true of you. This is why we don't believe in the works of the law. That's why Paul says, if anybody has confidence, I'm more. Circumcised on the eighth day, he goes on and on and on. And he says, look, all of that was nothing rubbish in comparison to knowing Christ and the value that's found in him. He says, I want to be found in him. Verse 9, chapter 3, Philippians. I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, which comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. He says, I've tried that. I've been there, done that where I try to be on that treadmill and work and work and work and work, and it got me nowhere. Even our righteousness, as Isaiah tells us, are like filthy rags. He says, even the best that we could present to God is nothing in comparison to what his standards are. And Paul says, I want to be found in Christ, not having my own righteousness, but that which comes through faith in him, through faith in him. So we see now we become the righteousness of God through this means. This is significant. This is significant. As we're moving forward, so much of our inability to tap into all of the blessings and the benefits and the promises of the Christian life have to do with the fact that we have these two realities separated from each other. Separated from each other. And they need to move into the same house. And God wants them to move into the same house so that they can benefit from one another. So this is that knowledge of God. We need to know the knowledge of God. We need to know God. That's his word. We need to know the truth as it concerns who he is. This is what we're doing as a church. This is what we're doing as a church. This not only benefits our, our own lives, it benefits our family, our community. It benefits what God is doing among us. You see... Every thought is about bringing it to obey Christ. Paul says that. What does that mean? When he says here in verse 5, we take every thought captive to obey Christ. What Paul is saying is, when we become Christians, we don't merely accept Jesus as Savior. We also accept him as Lord. Right? In other words... My thoughts are no longer my own thoughts. The way I get to think about myself and the way I get to think about God and the world and what he's up to is no longer up to just me. Now, the Christian life is about taking my thoughts and saying, Lord, does that, does that fly with what you say in your word? See, it's, it's a discipline, isn't it? In other words, he says, take how many thoughts? The ones you like? The ones you don't want to do anything with? No, he says, take every thought captive to obey Christ. There are some thoughts that are in disobedience to Jesus, and we're allowing them to sleep on the couch. And they should get the, the pink letter. They should get the eviction notice. And it's like, it's amazing how we're not ready to ditch Christianity we're not ready to ditch being a Christian, but it's amazing how many different thoughts we allow to still move in and have the couch. And Jesus is saying, the moment that you and I come into faith in Christ and become Christians, our Christian life, this is discipleship, our Christian life is about looking at the different thoughts that are floating around in my head at different times, taking them 
and running it under the sieve of scripture and saying, does it bring honor and pleasure and glory to my God and say, Savior? Does it, is, this, is this what he is up to in my life? Is this how my father in heaven sees me? Is this what my Savior was up to when he died for me? Is this what the Holy Spirit is saying or another spirit, right? We take every thought captive to obey Christ. And what happens on the end, other end of that? There's joy. There's joy. There's peace. There's, there's knowing my purpose now, right? There's knowing what it is that I'm here for, what God is up to, right? God doesn't want us to leave us in the dark from these things. So what does he do? He says, look, I've given you not only my son, I've given you my word so that now that you belong to me, you get to do this. May God help us in this area to take our thoughts captive, to obey Christ. This, this demonstrates when, when we do this, every time we do this, guess what we're doing? We're honoring him. We're honoring him. It's like, I want to make sure that he's pleased. Guess what? Because you and I are in Christ, we're not doing this to earn our salvation. That's the important thing we need to keep in mind. Remember, we're already saved. We belong to God. And it's because we're his. It's because we're in Christ that we get to move forward being about these very things in each of our lives. Now, some people, some people, they look at justification, they look at the righteousness of God as something in the past, like... I get it. I get it. It was, it was something that happened, that benefit, one and done. All right. All right. But what about now? I don't feel the Lord. I don't sense him. I just kind of feel like I'm missing out on the subjective side of the Christian faith. I, I just, I want to sense his, his presence. I want to experience the reality of his existence in my life. And I just feel like I'm removed from all of that. I just feel like all of that sort of thing is strange to me, even when we talk about this whole justification deal. I'll tell you why oftentimes in my life, I could speak for myself, why that often happens. It happens when I take my eyes off of myself. I'm sorry. It happens when I put my eyes on myself. It happens when I put my eyes on myself. Let me, let me see if I could explain what I mean by this. Year, years ago, we had a buddy who had a good friend who was an owner of a well-known spot in town. I'll leave the name um, unmentioned uh, in California. But in any case, we had the opportunity to be able to, to go there, okay? And you couldn't just go all by yourself. I mean, this place was highly sought after. I mean, you could tell by just showing up. Like The, the line just wrapped around the place, and everybody was dying to, to get in. But because of who we were with, we had access. And it was kind of amazing, like, wow. We got this much privilege and status simply because of this person that we're with. It's just this one person. All because of him knowing the right person in there, we get all of these benefits. Months later, fast forward, we tried to do the same thing except without that person. Uh, it wasn't happening. <laughs> and that's exactly what the Christian life is like. You and I never graduate from being in Christ. It not only explains how you get saved, it explains how you stay saved and you stay in right relationship with God. Some of us think, well, I've been in the church for a while, I've been serving, I'm in ministry now, I'm on staff, or I've, been, I've done this, I've been in missionary work. Surely, I know I needed Jesus when I first got saved, like I really needed him. I needed to be in him, otherwise the Father wouldn't accept me. But now, I've been at, at, now that I've been at this thing for a little while now, I think I could relate to God on my own terms. Uh-uh. No, we never can. We never can. We relate to God now in the same way we always have in Christ. The only way God has ever and God will ever find you and me pleasing in his sight, acceptable in his sight, is because of Jesus. It's because of Jesus. The same way I couldn't get into that spot without the person I was with. In the same way, I can't enjoy a relationship with God apart from Jesus. And so you know why I miss out oftentimes on that subjective experience? is because I try to start relating to God on my own terms. 
and I realize it's not working. You want to press into God? Press into God while you're in Christ. Don't try to come up with a way to be able to relate to God apart from Jesus. The only one who has ever and the only one who, who will ever grant you and me access into the presence of God to enjoy his intimacy, to enjoy his fellowship, is Jesus. It's Jesus. Paul says, Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ now lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. Notice, there's a now to his life. Paul didn't just have a, a way back when. I used to love the Lord. I used to serve the Lord. I used to know the Lord. I used to have sweet time with the Lord. No, no, no. He says, the life I now live with him, I live how? By faith. By faith. This is important. So we talked about the righteousness of God, but how do we access it? We access it through faith. What's faith? Some people like to talk about faith in terms of some leap of faith. But that's, that's not how the Bible describes faith. faith. Faith is described like a coin. How many sides are on a coin? Two. On the one side of the coin of faith is renunciation. I'll explain. Part of trusting in Jesus has to do with this one side of the coin of faith, renunciation. What do I mean? In order to properly and in order to truly trust in Jesus, you and I have got to come to a place where we, where we renounce renunciation, where we renounce a confidence, a trust, and a reliance upon ourselves. That's the big hurdle right there. One of the first steps to trusting in Jesus is renouncing all trust in self. It's amazing how much when we pay attention to ourselves and our lives, how much we place reliance and confidence. I got this. I'm good. Look, come on, no hands, right? We, we, we think I've, I've done it my way. We want to carve a path for ourselves. We want to think that we can do this. I got this. And God says, one of the first steps to experiencing what I have to offer you, one of the first steps to knowing your identity in Christ is renouncing all trust, all confidence, all reliance upon yourself and your own ability to get you there. But it's not just a renunciation. It's also taking that trust, taking that confidence, taking that reliance, and instead of using it on yourself, using it on Christ, on Christ. This is how we destroy strongholds. This is how we bring them down, right? I mean, after all, it was a confidence in my own ability to manage my own thoughts that allowed those renegade thoughts to come in in the first place. It's like, well, I know everybody told me that's not the way. No, well, I I'll, I'll check it out. It would like, just be like you being a good friend to somebody or you being a good parent to your child and saying, you know what? I've watched that cat. I don't think he's going to be good for you. I've seen some of her ways. I'm not too sure you're on that track. Right? It's like, oh, no, no. all of you guys are, I've got this, i got, only for you to discover it for yourself. It's like, man, he was right. She was right. He is that way. She is just like that. And in the same way, it's pride, it's this confidence, it's the, this reliance upon ourselves that allows us to entertain all these sort of thoughts that are contrary to the knowledge of God. You see, if I'm at school or I'm at work and somebody starts bad-mouthing my, bad my wife, my mom, my church family, a brother, a sibling, you know how to, you know how to flex on that. You know how to, be, you know how to respond. You, you wouldn't even allow it. But for some reason... For some reason, those same thoughts in the form of quote-unquote friends come entering into our heads, and they're saying all sorts of things about what God says and what God's Word says. And the question is, do we have that same response toward those thoughts? We can't allow them to coexist, but it's not just that. 
And this is what I want us to get as we're coming to a wrap here. It's, it's the way that you stop believing the lies, the arguments, the lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God is through faith. And what is faith? It's saying, I can't continue to trust in myself and I've got to begin trusting in my Savior. That's what brings the strongholds down. Why? Because the only thing that could allow bad thoughts, sinful thoughts, negative thoughts to have the light of day in my head is a confidence in myself. The moment I trust in myself, the moment I have some sort of self-reliance is the moment I make my headspace hospitable to all sorts of thoughts. And so do we want to deal with it? Let's trust in Jesus today. Let's go to God together today. And let's say, you know what, God? I don't know where I'm trusting in myself. I don't know where I've mis I have misplaced reliance going on in my life, but I'm prepared to see it wherever it is. Show me, God. I'm here for you, God. Lord, all I want to do is trust in you. I don't want to trust in myself. I know what I could do. I've seen what I could do. I've seen where I've led myself. Jesus, I want you at the helm. Jesus, I want you at the wheel. Jesus, I want you, Lord of my thoughts. Take these thoughts, Lord God, and take them captive to obey Jesus. God will honor that. God will honor that prayer. And I want to pray together with you. I want to believe together with you. Not just a prayer. You know you could pray. That's religious. You could pray but not have faith. I want us to pray believing that God's prepared to show up. Here. 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 Among our community. And do a new work. It doesn't matter what sort of thought patterns you came in here with. It doesn't matter what sort of strongholds presently exist. God has power. The Christian life has power. You're not alone. You're not helpless. The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to you, God. We praise you, Savior. We honor you, Lord God. Father, we come... before your presence because of Jesus. Lord, I pray for myself. I pray for my brothers and my sisters. We pray as a church. We come before you in faith. We renounce all confidence in the flesh. We renounce all sort of reliance upon ourselves. And we take that confidence and that reliance, and that trust, and we place it in you, Jesus Christ. Lord, forgive us for harboring thoughts that rise up against the knowledge of God. And Lord, we pray, forgive us for not taking thoughts that should have been taken captive to obey Christ. And so beginning today, we thank you for the righteousness that we have in Jesus. We thank you for who we are because of him. We thank you for the acceptance that we have in your sight. And Father, we pray that we would not be looking to ourselves, but be looking away from ourselves to our Savior. The one whose righteousness presently clothes us. God, this is good news. Father, this is freeing news that we've been liberated, that what was ours became his on the cross so that what was his can now become ours as a result of what he did on the cross. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this confidence and this freedom that we have because of the righteousness of God. And now, Lord, I pray that we do something about it. How? by beginning all over again to cease trusting in ourselves and to begin trusting in you. 
Lord, would you grant this measure of faith to this church family? There's somebody right now in doubt. There's someone right now struggling. There's someone even now overwhelmed, believing far more the thoughts that have built the stronghold in their life than the truth that is coming from God's word. And I pray in Jesus' name that you help them to bring down, to destroy that lie, to dispel that myth in their head. May their story be changed today. May that narrative be reversed today in Jesus' name. There are some who came in here telling themselves one story, but I pray by your grace they leave this place telling themselves a whole nother story, all because of who they now know they are in Christ. They are the righteousness of God in Christ. Father, I know this isn't easy. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. And I know this is a battle. That's why we called it winning the war within. There's an all-out assault for your people's minds and hearts. And I'm praying together with my brothers and sisters, fiercely, in Jesus' name, we will not have it. We will not bow out. We will not back down. We will not surrender. But we will rise from a place of knowing who we are. And we will march forth in our God. The righteous, the Bible says, are as bold as a lion because of the one who is with us. God, grant this, we pray. Do the impossible, we pray. Lord, with some, there are fiery arrows being shot from whichever direction, and there's just nothing but overwhelm, and I'm praying right now for that dear soul. Quench every fiery dart of the evil one. May the shield of your faith There are others internally conflicted, prepared to believe one thing as it relates to who they are in Christ, but they're still holding on to a a whole nother set of myths, arguments. You, You won't find them in the Bible. They're nowhere. You won't find them in the Old Testament or the New, but they've gotten them from somewhere and they're holding on to them and they do not believe that there is power available for them to access to destroy that stronghold. And that power is, this is your victory, even your faith. It's your faith. It's your faith, not in your faith, but it's your faith in your God who loved you enough to give you his son. A son who not only lived perfectly on your behalf, but who died on your behalf. It's your faith. I pray, Lord God, right now that they would know, that they would know that you have given them the faith so that they could not only cease trusting in themselves, but that so that they can begin trusting in you, the lover of their soul. The one who, Paul says, in the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And what? Gave himself for me. You you, You trust in a Savior who gave himself for you. He gave himself for you. So Father, we pray right now as we conclude this service of ours, free people, begin freeing people all across this room in Jesus' name. Set captives free in Jesus' name. Bring about breakthrough. Bring about healing. Bring about steps of recovery. Help people to begin to see themselves moving forward. Some have been too stagnant It's just been a deer in the headlights experience for their Christian life. They're frozen. And Lord, I pray right now, free her up, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Free them up right now in Jesus' name. 
Help them to see and know who all they are in you, Lord God, we pray. We thank you for these things. We celebrate you for the victory that is ours. Father, as we close, I pray that the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.